بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقل للمؤمنات يغضبن من أبصارهن ويحفظن فروجهن ولا يبدين زينتهن إلا ما ظهر منها وليضربن بخمرهن على جيوبهن ولا يبدين زينتهن إلا لبعولتهن أو آبائهن أو آبائهن أو أباء بعولتهن أو أبنائهن أو أبناء بعولتهن أو إخوانهن أو بني إخوانهن أو بني أخواتهن أو نسائهن أو ما ملكت أيمانهن أو التابعين غير أولي الإربة من الرجال أو الطفل الذين لم يظهروا على عورات النساء ولا يضربن بأرجلهن ليعلم ما يخفين من زينتهن وتوبوا إلى الله جميعا أيها المؤمنون لعلكم تفلحون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين يا رب العالمين ثم اما بعد everyone once again السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, we are coming upon a long ayah in the Quran and this ayah is a contrast with the ayah before the ayah before was about men and how they must lower their eyes and it's important to note that Allah spoke to men lowering their eyes first that was the first priority uh, a lot of times when people ask the question why must women cover and uh, the answer is given, well, because men will keep staring at them otherwise. Right? And that's the reason that's given. That's actually not the Qur'an's way of reasoning. Because if that was the reason, then actually women would have been mentioned first, and then, therefore, women should lower their eyes. But regardless of women being told to cover or not, men have already been told to lower their eyes. You see? So that actually came first. So it's not dependent on... You know, and then people use these silly rationales. Well, if she wasn't dressed like that, then they wouldn't treat her that way, or they wouldn't talk to her that way, etc., etc. Whether that's true or not, that's not the reason, the rationale of the religion. The religion puts individual responsibility on men and individual responsibility on women, regardless of the other. If you're in a society where nobody's dressed appropriately, you still have to lower your eyes. If you're in a society where everybody's dressed appropriately, you still have to lower your eyes. Your behavior in obedience to Allah is not dependent on the other side. Similarly, your behavior is not a reaction. What Allah asks you to do is not in reaction to men. It's for you. It's not for anyone else. And that's the correct view of looking at the commandments Allah gave. Allah didn't tell, to, to me, I don't, I'm not convinced at all that you can argue on behalf of Islam that Allah told men to cover or women to cover to protect them from men. That's not the argument. The argument is Allah told women to cover because it's better for them. That's the argument. And that's why ذَلِكُمْ azkalakum. That is better for you. That is purer for you. Then huwa azkalakum. It's better for you. It's purer for you. You know? For who? Who's benefiting? You are. That's the, that's the argument. So unfortunately a lot of times because outsiders, non-Muslims, critics of Islam, they talk about Islam as something that is male-centric or puts women down or gives compares men to women in this way or that way or women have these rights versus men have those rights and they constantly pit ever since the you know post-feminism we're constantly looking at everything from the lens of feminism right so you compare men to women in everything but our religion is actually never comparing these two different creatures they have their space and they have theirs and Allah even told us not to compare. لا تتمنوا ما فضل الله به بعضكم على بعض. The ayah of Surah An-Nisa that I made reference to. You each have your own roles and your own responsibilities. You're not even supposed to wish for what the other has, you know. And so th th that concept of just this comparison is to me problematic. And then people have a problem with that comparison, and that's okay. But they confuse that problem of comparison to be a problem of Islam. That's not a problem of Islam. That's your problem. That's not a problem in the book either. It's not a problem in the sunnah of the Prophet either. Sallallahu alayhi wa So now with that in mind, we're going to get to women. And it no, you'll notice that the ayah that was for men was very brief. يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ They should lower their, you know, take away somewhat from their gaze. And then, وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ And guard their privates. That's better for them. ذَلِكَ أَسْكَ لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ Allah knows what they craft. That's it. Done. Guys understand what they craft and they're clear. Enough instruction. But when it came to women, all of what I just recited to you in the beginning was one ayah for women. It's like five times longer. It's way longer. So Allah really went after the women. Why? He went after the women because He highlighted things to them that, is not, that are not as obvious. What is obvious to, for men, this subject is very simple. Don't look at them. Okay. 
You look at him, you'll get tempted. I know. Simple, straightforward. The thing about women, and I've been around enough women in my life to know, you know, in my family, I know, they don't realize, many of them don't, especially the ghafilat. Remember ghafilat was mentioned already? Ghafilat means what? They're unaware. They're actually unaware of the effect of their presence. Some really terrible women are really, really aware of the effect of their presence. And they use the effect of their presence. You know? They dress provocatively and they put perfumes on and they do this other stuff exactly because they, they get a high off of the effect they have on men. But there are a majority of believing women that are completely innocent of that kind of behavior. They have no idea what it does when they walk by to a guy. I'm wearing hijab, the girl says, I'm wearing hijab, I'm dressed properly, I'm just going to college, I just walked by the cafeteria, what's wrong with that? And the guy's life just changed. He's, the sky is not the same color to him anymore, you know, flowers are more beautiful, you know, the mosquito bite no longer itches, everything has changed in his life, because she has no idea the effect she had on him, no clue at all. She's sitting in a class smiling, he saw her smile and... You know, he, does, he doesn't see anything else anymore. He's running into poles in the street, you know, knocking books over because he's just, he's lost. Women have a certain presence, ar uh, you know, around them. And they don't, they're not aware of the effect that they have, you know. And so Allah makes, goes out of their way to make them realize that effect. Men are very aware of the effect of women. Men are very aware. Men are sitting in a restaurant eating food and they hear clack, clack clack like it could be a 90 year old it could be a 15 year old it doesn't matter <laughs> it's gonna be ijma you know you hear the, the sound of a woman from the side of your eye you see a woman walk by first one's for you right the prophet said first one's for you and you won't even know it you'll just do it it's almost subconscious Men are astutely aware of the presence of women. Women, however, no clue. Some of them are. Some of them are very keen observers around them. But the vast majority of them are ghafilat, especially among the believing community. They're innocent. They have no idea. And so Allah went out of His way to let them know that they have to look out for certain things. And tell the believing women, they should lower somewhat from their gaze as well. Now Allah is letting us know that attraction isn't just from a man to a woman. A woman can also be attracted to a man. And she can also be staring at him for hours and hours and hours. And then and thinking and thinking and thinking. And Allah says, chill out, lady. Calm down. You need to calm down too. So it's not just a one-way problem. Now, some women don't have that problem. Some women look at men and go, Tuh! like, they don't like it. And that's fine. But other women do have that problem. Other women do find men attractive. And, that, and it messes with them. And the thoughts come in their head. And so Allah tells them too, just like He told men, started with the same way. Lower their eyes. And they should guard their privates. The, their eyes are also connected to their chastity. Just like the men's eyes were connected to their chastity. But there's no tasna'oon uh, or yasna'na. Allah knows better what they craft. The craft wasn't mentioned. You know why? Because Allah is talking about believing women. Believing women don't scheme to seduce a guy. Believing guys still want to get a girl to proposal. You know, they still want to kind of show up somewhere. And, oh, you're at this eat party too? Kind of thing. Innocently. That's okay. There's, there's the innocent parts of sunnah. There's innocent aspects to crafting your presence, you know. Oh, I'm not, I didn't know you were taking this Arabic class. <laughs> you know. That's okay. It's innocent. It's fine. You got away with it. So it's, it's cool, you know. Maybe somehow you ended up sitting next to her dad. You know, one of these days. Just made friends with him. Yeah, engineering student, mashallah, you know. It's just, you know. She's looking to get married, you know, to study, someone to study Qur'an with. If I just had a, yeah. Inshallah, if you know anyone, let me know. <laughs> it's kinda, that's part of your sunnah. That's part of your craft. It's okay. You can play the game. Girls, they may not do that. They may not do that. 
And Allah doesn't highlight that about them. They might do it, but Allah doesn't actually hold them to account because that's not a normal thing. You know, they, they far more are, are pursued than are in pursuit. And even if they are in pursuit, for a lot of girls, you know, I get, and I don't know this because I know how girls think. I just know this because I get way too many emails from women. Way too many. I like this person. I don't know how to tell them. I like this person. I don't know how to tell them. They've never said anything to me, but I like them. And I really like them. And I really like them. Okay, you like them. <laughs> Go tell them. No, I can't do that. I just, I wish they knew. <laughs> Psychically. Okay. You know. Guy likes a girl. You just, you could just tell. Girl likes a guy. You can't tell. You can't tell. And they're hoping that they do something about it, but they're, you know, it's the, the shyness, the modesty comes into play and they hold themselves back, right? Men are far more aggressive in approach, right? And they want to pursue. And that's just the nature of things. Anyway, so, they should guard their, uh, they should lower and hold back from their, their gaze as well, their eyes as well. Uh, and they should guard their privates as well. In other words, they're also subject to temptation. Ah. Oh. Now the next part, and they should not expose their beauty. They should not expose their beauty. Now this is open-ended. Expose, don't expose their beauty. And then when you say expose their beauty, well, uh, what should I do? I think I should not go outside because I don't want to expose my beauty. You know, and is, is this open-ended? But actually Allah in His mercy, He qualified it. He said, إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا Except for what is obvious from within it. In other words, a woman is beautiful, no matter how much she covers herself, she's still beautiful, she can't help it. And she gets compliments all the time from other girls, and she notices guys are staring, and she notices it, and she feels bad about it, but if, if she's observing what Allah told, how Allah told her to cover herself, then she's done what she could. There's some things about herself she can't hide. She just can't help it. That's, not, that's beyond her. It's not her fault. You see? So, إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا Except for what is obvious from her. وَالْيَضْرِبْنَا now, now we get to the juicy part. Uh, about the, the covering of the head. وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ uh, and by, uh, So he says, and they should, they should, literally says they should strike with their khumur, their scarves, their strike their scarves over their chests. Okay, that's the literal language. Juyub is actually the chest cavity. Jayb is actually when you wear a blouse or a, a dress or a woman wears a dress, there's a cut. That, and a cut points to the chest cavity. The idea is that what you draw over yourselves is supposed to cover that chest cavity and draw over it. But the cloth that is mentioned is khimar. Khimar is the singular form, khumur is the plural form. The Quran doesn't use the word hijab. Hijab actually means a curtain or a barrier, a wall. That's a hijab. Hijab is not on your head. Somebody's wearing a hijab on their head, they should be in a circus. Because they're, they're carrying a wall on their head. That's a very strong neck, okay? So that's not a hijab. But the, the head covered, as you're dressed, the sisters are dressed here right now, that is a khimar. That's called a khimar, okay? So that's what the ayah is. فَلْيَضْرِبْنَا بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُّبِهِنَّ Now, on this, I've given a four-hour lecture just on this ayah. I've, I've done it before, and I'm sure you haven't seen it. That's okay. I'm going to give you the summarized version of that. Uh, it was actually done in response to something. Look, my personal belief from whatever I've been able to understand of Allah's deen, is that people are not to be held accountable by me as a da'i, as someone who's trying to invite people to the word of Allah. I am not accountable to judge whether or not you pray, or whether or not you dress the way that Quran says you dress, or whether or not you eat pork or something. My job is to try to clarify what the book says, and to try to share the beauty and the wisdom of this book. Because at the end of the day, the, the thing that changes behavior is the heart. And I cannot change anyone's heart. That's what Allah does. And if your heart changes, then what you decide to do is your business. I can't judge you on what you do. All I can do is share. That's all I can do. Uh, even the Prophet was told, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْطِرْ Remind, all your, your only role is to be someone who reminds. You're not in charge of them. You can't control what they do. I'm not interested in controlling what you do. So if a woman wears hijab or doesn't wear hijab, that's not my problem. That's not under my control. That's not something I'm concerned with. I'm concerned with trying to represent the book of Allah. Allah says, tabu aslahu wa There's people who hide the book, and then there are people who make tawbah, they fix themselves, and they clarify the book. 
I'd like to count all of us among the people who hopefully do that. We clarify the book to ourselves and to others, right? That's what we want to be. Now, one thing that really bothered me recently, it was about a year ago, I think, uh, there were a series of emails and there was uh, videos made about how the Quran uh, does not actually talk about women covering their head. The Quran only talks about a scarf that you throw over your chest. Okay, so a shawl, just wear a shawl. Uh, and since a lot of people who say that, they don't believe in the sunnah, they don't believe in hadith literature, they say, only hadith says cover your head, Quran never says cover your head, and therefore it's not really that important. So it's a cultural Arab thing, but it's not really a sharia thing, it's not a Quran thing, it's not from Allah's word. Now the only thing missing in these people's understanding is uh, knowledge of the Arabic language. They don't know Arabic, clearly, because if they did, they wouldn't be talking like this. And a, a lot of people that are talking like this are actually of Arab origin, which is funny. Because now Arabs don't know Arabic, you know? The word khimar, I will take my time in explaining. Because that's the heart of the matter. You're supposed to take the khimar and take the khimars and throw them over the chest. That's what Allah says, yeah? So let's look at the origin of the word. Khamara yakhmuru is mean, means to be veiled, for something to be covered. Al-khamar taghtiya wal mukhalata yakunu dhalika ma'as satr. It's again, something that is mixed together or held together uh, and covered. Khamaraha, he covered her. Again, the meaning of covering. But then, khamr, with a sukun, khamr, means wine. You know why? Because it messes with your head. It takes over your head. Linguistically, the word khamr means something that takes over your head. That's why khimar and khamr come from the same origin. Though this is a scarf that is meant to be on the head. By definition. Takhamartu. A woman putting lotion over her head or over her face is takhamarat even. Al khimar is also used for men. For one of the words in Arabic for the turban of a man is a khimar too. Now you don't wear khimar on your knees. Nor did women men wear turbans around their chest. Women men wear the turban on their head. Al imama al khimar. That's that's not a Sharia definition. That's not the opinion of Imam Shafi'i or Imam Malik or Imam Abu Hanifa. This is how the Arabs used this word before Islam even came. We're not even discussing the fiqh of this. We're just talking about the language of it. The language of it is explicitly clear. As a matter of fact, they call a horse, this is so cool, a horse sometimes has multiple colors, right? So if a horse, his head all the way to his neck is one color, and the rest of it is a different color, they'll say, Hisan Muhammad, that horse has a khimar on it. So now, that's, that's how they talked, man. Like, what chest? What are you talking about? Khimar includes the head. Uh, they actually use this as a compliment. Women were, uh, Khimar was a style of the Arab woman. We'll read that inshallah in Zamakhshari's commentary. I'll, I took his because others have said similar things. I just picked one of them to read through. Uh, they'll compliment a woman who knows how to put a scarf on and say, Innaha la hasanatul khimra. That lady knows how to put a scarf on. La hasanatul khimra. She knows how to cover her head right. Because it was a fashion statement before Islam. Right? Covering the head. Inna al awan la tu'allamul khimra. Uh, and they say, uh, you know, a newly uh, or a married woman who's been married a long time, she doesn't have to be taught how to cover her head. She knows how to dress. She's a seasoned woman, you know. She knows how to take care of herself, basically. Uh, this was actually part of their makeup, part of their fashion statements. The difference is, I'll, I'll break the mystery to you now. They used to cover their head or turn it into a braid or something, and it was a long scarf. The scarf actually comes down to the middle of the stomach. But they used to tie it up with their hair and throw it behind them, and then wear low-cut dresses. That was called a khimar. The original khimar was, it covered the head, went in with the hair, and was thrown behind the back, and then they would wear low-cut and jewelry and things like that. Okay? Now, all Allah did was say, take that same khimar, which is already covering the head, because that's part of the definition, take that same khimar, and take the rest of that cloth that you threw behind you, and do what with it? Throw it over the chest. So now reverse it, just the new trend. Cover the chest, over your juyub, which they love to expose. So he literally took the fashion statement that they used to have and reformed it. He didn't say, come up with a new outfit, just says, wear it differently. Just wear it differently. So they didn't have to come up with new clothing for themselves to do that. Um, and uh, by the way, they say, khamara uh, ina'ahu. When you put, if I, if I put a lid over this cup, this is takhmirul ina. Now when you cover this cup, do you cover it from the bottom, middle or top? To cover it off from the top, so khimar goes on top. It's not on the middle of the body, it's on top of the body. Okay? So there's several linguistic evidences that this word necessarily has to do with the head. Now, 
كان جيوبهن واسعة تبدو منها نحورهن وصدورهن uh, This is Zimakshiri's commentary He says that their, their, their cuts used to be wide open uh, and they used to display their chest and they used to display part of the neck وَمَا حَوَالِيهَا and around it كُنَّا يَزْدِلْنَا الْخَمْرِ and they used to let the, the scarf dangle uh, مِنْ وَرَائِهِنَّ from behind them فَتَبْقَ مَشْكُوفَ so it remained exposed فَأُمِرْنَا بِأَنْ يَزْدِلْنَهَا so they were told to hang it over usely, loosely مِنْ قُدَّامِهِنَّ from in front of them حَتَّى يَغْطِينَهَا until they cover the chest وَيَجُوزَ أَنْ يُرَادْ بِالْجُيُوبِ الصُّدُورِ تَسْبِيَةً بِمَا يَلِيهَا وَيُلَابِسُهَا the word جُيُوبِ which means chest cavity is being used to basically talk about the entire chest because part of Arabic style is you talk about something by talking about what is associated with so when you say cover this bone means cover the chest. Doesn't mean you take a scarf and you just kind of line it over here. It just means you cover the entire chest. This is what the Quran does all the time. For example, Allah told Adam alayhi salam not to eat from the fruit. He said don't eat from the tree. Right? He's not going to go bite on the bark. But Allah never mentions fruit. He always mentions what? Tree. So it's understood from tree that it's associated with the fruit. So the same way juyub is used to cover. Just It, 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 it captures the meaning. وَمِنْهُ قَوْلُهُمْ نَاسِحُ الْجَيْبِ وَضَرَبْتُ ضَرَبَتْ بِخِمَارِهَا عَلَى جَيْبِهَا كَقَوْلِكَ ضَرَبْتُ بِيَدَيَّ عَلَى الْحَائِطِ Like I, you know, when you, when you uh, slap a wall or you strike something, the word ضَرْب is used and inshallah we'll see the benefit of why this word is so important. Now this ayah came down and Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها narrates مَا رَأَيْتُ نِسَاءً خَيْرًا مِّن نِسَاءِ الْأَنصَارِ I never seen women better than the women of the Ansar. Now, uh, you know, I want you to understand that Sahaba have very different perspectives. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu was really scared of the women of the Ansar. He's like, they're not like these Makkah women, they're really loud. Like you told the Prophet some, they're not, they talk, they, they keep asking you questions. And they want special halaqas just for them. And they, keep, they interrupt you in the middle of your speech. And one of them even came to the Prophet and the Prophet she said, my husband, he had a fight with me, and he told me that from today, you're like my mother. What do I do? And the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't say anything because he didn't know what to say. He, he was waiting for revelation. And he says, answer me. You need to answer me. And she wouldn't leave. I have small children. You need to tell me what to do. And she's getting louder and louder. And you know in, in the Quran, لا ترفعوا أصباتكم فوق صوت النبي Don't raise your voice above the voice of the Prophet. And this woman's yelling. And Quran is going to come down and I'm thinking, this woman is done. Oh my God. And Allah says, قَدْ زَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِ إِلَى اللَّهِ Allah heard the word of the one who was complaining to you and arguing with you about her spouse and complaining to Allah and Allah is listening to every... Allah sided with her. Those women are not like the women of Quraysh or the women of Makkah. They're a different category. But Aisha anha, who's from Makkah comes to Medina and loves the women of the Ansar. It's like, these ladies are great! <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> so different perspectives, different Sahaba, different perspectives. Anyway, so she says they're the best. لما نزلت هذه الآية قامت كل واحدة من منهن إلى مرتها المرحلي. Every one of them, when this ayah came down, stood up and they took the loose part of their dress, ripped it up, and covered their heads immediately. Other narrations, they were cooking in the middle of cooking, they would tear their apron and just cover their heads as they heard the ayah. In real time. Not let me finish this meal and do it. Because they didn't know if you're supposed to do it inside the home or not. You're, co you're cooking inside the home. It's private. But they didn't know. So they just immediately just covered themselves. Subhanallah. When the ayah is not even done yet. It's a long ayah. Just they heard that much and they just covered themselves. They cut locks from their, their cloth. She said, it was so awkward because they cut unevenly. They were so desperate to fulfill the command of Allah. They cut their dresses so unevenly to cover their heads. It looked like dead crows were sitting on their head. <laughs> you know, it's so beautiful. They were so eager to do it. You know, so when I hear today a, a, a woman say, well, I'm not so comfortable with this whole hijab thing. I'm not sure why we're supposed to do it. I don't blame her, but I say, you know what? You're a woman, and they were women. And they were so eager to do it. There must be something different in the way you view it and the way they view it. Maybe the way they perceived it as something that can only be better for them. Something that has been given as a gift from Allah. A crown that has been handed to them from Allah. Maybe that's a sign of iman for them. 
You can tell a believing woman that because she's, she's wearing the crown that Allah gave her, you know, just immediately you can tell she's, she's observing this, this gift from Allah at, and they just saw it like that and maybe you don't see it like that. You just see it as a rule that men put on women. Maybe you see it, like, maybe you see it incorrectly. I mean, that's the only difference. Because they were so eager to do it. Were they eager to do it when there was a man around or just on their own? On their own. There was not in reaction to anyone else. And that's the nature of the believing man and the believing women.